Welcome to this video about the Macintosh SE computer. The Macintosh SE was introduced on March 2nd, 1987, discontinued August 1st, 1989. It had a Motorola 68K processor running at 8 megahertz and 1 megabyte of RAM, blah 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 blah. Look, if you tuned into this video, you probably know all this, so I'm not going to waste your time. Let's get into the more interesting facts about this machine. At the time that this video was made, the average Macintosh SE is 25 years old. Though many were manufactured, once technology was far enough ahead, they just became worthless doorstops. Those that survived obsolescence and the landfill, or the Macquarium business, are generally in the hands of collectors. Finding one to purchase online requires patience. Because there is a collector's market, most sellers have inflated ideas of how much these are worth. Generally, you shouldn't pay more than, say, $40 for an old Mac SE. This is my retirement, man. It can't be $40. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, sorry to give you the hell. <laughs> it's crazy because I paid less than $40 for this bunch of G4s, which are half the age of the Mac SE, and I'm now using them as a makeshift coffee table. If you are looking to buy an SE, be aware of a couple things. First, watch for phosphor burn-in on the screen. SEs that were in service a long time, especially those that had institutional use, will be especially prone. This one I can tell because university students love their stickers. Those affected will have the menu bar permanently etched into the screen. I'll enhance it here with a UV lamp, which will make the phosphor glow, and you can better see the burn-in. Also watch for a screen that is dim overall, even on maximum brightness. Obviously if the seller states that the inside of the case was signed by Steve Jobs, it was not. The original Macintosh 128 case molds were engraved with the signatures of the team including founders Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. But plastic injection molds are quite expensive, so the early case molds were simply repurposed for new models like the SE. There was no sense clearing away those old signatures since few would ever open up the case to see it. In the SE, Steve Jobs' signature survived the modification, still front and center. But of course, Woz got the short end of the stick, thanks to the expansion port. New molds were eventually built and signed cases became more and more rare until they disappeared by the time the Macintosh Classic came along. Before the SE, the Macintosh Plus was the top of the Mac line. The SE was very different than the Plus. In fact, practically every component other than the screen was different. Steve Jobs left Apple in September 1985, just before the Plus was first released in January 1986. This made the SE the first Mac that had no direct influence from Steve Jobs. This was no doubt part of the reason that the SE was so different. It's well known that Steve hated the noise of cooling fans, so everything up until the SE was cooled by vents in the top of the case. But this didn't always do the trick, forcing users who want to protect their investment to use even less elegant solutions like the Kensington System Saver, slides on like so, or the Mac Chimney. With this, and Steve Jobs out of the picture, and putting a hard drive inside the computer, they decided to put a fan in the SE. But their first attempt at a fan was a failure. The strange fan that they originally decided on was often noisy and caused interference with the video signal. Apple quietly offered to replace these early fans with standard fans. Here you see the Rev-B analog board on the left versus the Rev-A. I mean, check this out. That would be a shock to the users of older Macs. The SE stood for System Expansion, another thing Steve Jobs was trying to avoid by design. 
This is the processor direct slot, which gave the computer its name. Typically, users would upgrade the processor to a 68020 or 030 on cards such as this. This is the 030 processor with the math coprocessor. Just pop it on like so, and now you essentially have a Macintosh SE30. You could also add DOS cards and network cards like Ethernet or external display cards, for example, using the rear knockout slot. The SE was targeting business, and that showed in the advertising and the prices. Unfortunately, this focus on business and high prices kept the machines out of the hands of most consumers, eventually leading to Apple's downfall in the 90s. For example, here's a campus store price sheet from 1988 showing the three available configurations of SE, the 240 config being a newer option. Now these are Canadian prices at a time when the Canadian dollar was really weak versus the US greenback, but you can see how much of a premium you are paying over the plus. You had two main choices when buying an SE, with two floppy drives or a floppy drive and an internal hard drive. If you got the internal hard drive, the top floppy port was covered and a red LED would indicate the drive activity. In later Macs, they did away with having a hard disk activity lamp. So if you replace the original hard drive, you'll likely lose your hard drive lamp. In the price list, you see the markup of $1,000 for the hard drive option. The best thing to do at the time, buy the dual floppy and then a third party external hard drive. Although Apple points out that the internal hard drive has faster data speeds, yeah, so? At the time, a hard drive was not mandatory, but it was a huge convenience. So here's our external 20 meg hard drive by Rodime. Maybe the reason these guys went out of business was their packaging cost. But they built a good hard drive. It still boots up. For $1,000 it should, I guess. Of course, Apple also sold their own external SCSI hard drives. More adventurous users would go a step further, adding a hard drive bracket inside the case to have two floppies and a hard drive. This is a have your cake and eat it too solution. Now the 80s floppy drives had no doors over the drive slots. So the SE shipped with plastic floppy drive protectors to be retained and inserted if you planned to transport the computer from place to place. And why did they call them floppy anyway? Well, they inherited the name from the five and a quarter inch disc, which were actually floppy, and the earlier eight inch disc, which just looks comical nowadays. Also included was the programmer's reset switch Apple stated in the instructions only to install it if you plan to do programming, so few SEs seem to actually have the switch. Early SEs had the clock battery soldered in, which was really short-sighted and backwards, since you could never really easily change them like you could on the Plus. On the other hand, this SE from 1987 has a battery that still works, even though it was only rated for seven years. Later models would have a battery holder, which became the standard going forward. Well, except for that block battery and those goofy second generation Power Max. Oh, piece of junk. Unlike the Plus, Apple gave you a choice of new ADB keyboards. And by choice, they meant separate purchase. You could get the standard keyboard at $129, or the Titanic extended keyboard designed to match IBM keyboards for $229. And also the design is very... Okay, enough with the stickers, guys. The new power button on the keyboard was for the Macintosh 2 only, giving rise to endless questions from new Mac users asking what the button does. You just do anything? The original Mac keyboard is dwarfed by the extended keyboard. The extended keyboard's large size and adherence to the IBM PC standards made it unpopular with early Macintosh fans. The extended keyboard came with an overlay so you could label your function keys. 
Unfortunately, it gave many of the keyboards some bad suntan lines. The newly designed ADB mouse did come free with a system. And it's as easy to use as this Macintosh, the computer for the rest of us. Okay, okay, the old original Macintosh commercials made fun of IBM's manuals, but look at all the manuals you get with the SE. You got the getting started and then the quick reference card and the owner's guide, uh, the printer manual, uh, the utilities user guide, the hypercard user's guide, and then of course the operating system user guide. Speaking of the operating system, the Mac SE started shipping with System 4. But when they reached System 4.2, the Finder got bumped up to version 6, and so Apple called it System Software 5. Confusing. This lasted about half a year, then came System 6. System 6 was probably the optimum OS for this computer. System 6.0.2 was the first widespread version. You could upgrade to System 7 if you wanted to, but it's a pretty hefty OS for the SE's speed. You need at least 2 mega RAM, a hard drive for sure, and worst of all, you lose the monkey system alert. In 1989, Apple would discontinue the dual floppy model and upgrade the double density floppy drive to a high density floppy drive. This would extend the SE's life another year. They called these FDHD and later they called it a super drive. It was a good option for those who cannot afford the new SE30. The downside of collecting these old computers is that the hard drives and other components will eventually fail. If you're interested in maintaining your factory original SE, they'll become more and more challenging. For now, just enjoy the machines for what they are, being hands-on with the history they represent, and relive those early exciting days of Macintosh. <laughs>